Hello and welcome to the Answers for Cancers podcast. I am your host, Anne-Marie Fay, And I'm Michelle Matthews. Together with some of Ireland's leading experts, we want to unravel what it truly means to have cancer. From consultant diagnosis to treatment plans, from managing your symptoms to supports available, we have it covered. So whether you're a nurse working in oncology or have been personally affected by cancer, this podcast is for you. We would like to say a special thank you to Pfizer Healthcare Ireland for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Dr. Sinead Lynch is a senior counselling psychologist with the Psych Oncology team in the Matter Hospital in Dublin. With a doctorate in counselling psychology from Trinity College Dublin, Sinead explains to us how events in her personal life led her into her passion for psychology for cancer patients. The Psych Oncology service was set up in the Matter Hospital in 2021 and from my personal experience on the ground I've seen the incredible positive impact this service has had for our patients. Sinead is also running a study called the Comfort Trial, which is for people who have had a progression or recurrence of cancer during the COVID-19 pandemic, and this may be of interest to some of our listeners. In this episode, we discuss the difference between pity and self-compassion and how self-kindness does not mean giving in. Sinead helps us to understand the difference between what is a normal feeling after a cancer diagnosis and when we should seek help. She also talks us through practical tips of managing our mental health and the importance of breathing. And she closes with a beautiful mindfulness practice. We hope you enjoy this episode as much as we did. Uh, good afternoon. Sinead, thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast. I might just kick it off by asking you, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and your interest in the area of psychology? Okay, well, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm Sinead. Uh, I'm the psychologist in the psycho-oncology department. I'll talk a little bit maybe later about the whole team. There's more than just me. Um, but I initially studied psychology about 25 years ago um, in UCD. And I kind of thought at the time, this is great, but I'll go back to it later in life. I had this, you know, stereotypical view that, I don't know, maybe I had a counselor in mind or something, but I expected it to be a much older person and maybe someone with life experience. And I was, you know, 18 and kind of thought, oh, hang on, I want to do something creative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, I suppose, you know, long story short, I ended up working in television and I spent about 10 years working in television. Um, and when I was 26, my own mum was diagnosed with cancer and that obviously just rocked my world and it changed everything. I think I hadn't really, I enjoyed TV from a perspective of this is a bit of fun, but I was always wondering what was gonna be next. Um, always felt like I was kind of questioning, you know, is this a career? Um, you know, a difficult career as well, like sort yeah, of unsteady. Right. Um, and so when my mum got cancer, it sort of put a lot of things in perspective and I sort of felt like I grew up a lot. Um, and I really understand the experience of what it's like when someone you love has cancer. Yeah. Mm. So, um, you know, she had a difficult four years and then she died from cancer. And at that point, you know, as I said, it rocked my world, but it changed my whole perspective on life. Mm. Um, and I felt like I really wanted to go back to something that I loved and felt passionate about. Um, and that was, I suppose, psychology, but then I was really focused on how do I work? Like, how do I zone in and make this, um, I suppose, not just a profession, but how do I make this like the, the passionate work that I had felt at that point um, later in life, you know, really, really good friend died from cancer. And I remember when I was in the room with him, when he was told how, how bad it was, um, he described it as just like a white noise and he couldn't hear anything. And when we went outside, you know, he just broke down and, and a nurse followed and sort of said, you know, we're sorry. And, you know, is there anyone you can talk to? Um, and I suppose it just highlighted to me that need for people to be able to talk about the experience of having mm. cancer. Um, and so, yeah, many years more of study then I went back and I studied psychotherapy. I went mm. and studied counseling psychology. Um, in Trinity. And I, I suppose my first step into psycho-oncology was in St. Vincent's University Hospital. It was on a placement. Um, and I got to combine kind of my TV career with psychology and um, with RTE and with Paul Dalton and Vincent's. We created a, a documentary with cancer patients from the Marie Keating Foundation and we walked the Camino and we practiced mindfulness and it was mm. amazing to bring the two together and to mm. produce that and that was in 2016. So, and then a few years later, I was constantly going, okay, I'm graduated now, yeah. I'm yeah. You know, fully fledged, <laughs> where can I get my job? Um, and was constantly looking and then the job came up in the matter and I was like, wow, dream job. Mm. Yeah. You know, everyone I've lost before me, including my poor dog, Edgar, who also got cancer at, at one point in my life, I felt, mm. seriously, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I was like, you know, help me through this and uh, and get and get me where I need to be. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I've been here in the matter for two years now. And mm, brilliant. I actually think we started around the same time. I kind of remember there was, I started about two years ago as well. And there was like an influx of new people around the same time. And I remember thinking they're new. They're, yeah, you know, yeah. New people are yeah. new. But we're so sorry to hear about your mum and your, yeah. your friend Sinead. And thanks so much for, for sharing that with us. I think it's so reflective sometimes when you're caring for people and you have personally gone through something yourself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. your style just changes altogether doesn't yeah. it because you can really sympathize and understand with how they're feeling. yeah and uh, and you know sometimes people say even in maybe in training in psychology you know how do you listen or is it because you've been there mm. and of course that's not true like as psychologists we can't have experienced everything that yes. people experience um and that's where the training comes in but for me, I guess, yes, I have experienced mm. that sense of, of being with someone from, you know, the beginning to the end mm. and more than once. Yeah. Um, and so I think sometimes when you can really not just have that empathy, but that further yeah. step of kind of compassion, mm-hmm. um, you know, it just it takes you to a different place past training. And as you said, your own life experience changes with that um, different perspective. And what, what's meaningful for you in life kind of becomes the most important mm. thing then. And it takes your passion to like a whole nother level, doesn't it? Yes. And I suppose it's really evident in the work that you're doing with the team, like you said, in with psychoecology in the matter. And we know that you're celebrating this second year anniversary yes. with psychooncology, <laughs> which is massive congratulations. It opened in March, like we just said. Um, I suppose, what was that like starting that whole service mm. within the hospital? Yeah, so when I started, it was just Edel there. So Edel is our psychooncology CNS. Um, and I think I started about a week after Edel and mm. the two of us were in this small office up at the top of the building yeah. on Michael Street yeah. and we we're like right you know it was really daunting yes. um, and of course you know we had different backgrounds but it was really about I suppose not only following the NCCP model because mm. it was through the NCCP that kind of funded these mm. posts it was like right what you know what's our vision here mm. um, and what does it look like on the ground as well it yeah. can be very different can't it yeah, yeah. well especially because on, a, on one hand it was so lovely but everyone was so enthusiastic about us joining but on the other hand it was overwhelming because there was like okay we have so many referrals we'd love yes. to see so many people yeah um and you know being able to provide a service where we're trying to holistically not just look at the diagnosis of cancer mm. and what it's like on the body mm. but also what it's like for the person emotionally mentally you yeah. know what is their mental health yeah. not just in the realm of do they have a history of any sort of you know mental illness yeah. or any mental health issues but mm. rather that you know as we've just said like you know getting a cancer diagnosis mm. can can really change your life absolutely um, it's, it's nearly like a, a trauma uh, yes. when it happens to somebody like yeah yeah and we all have different coping skills yeah. and maybe we've never realized before what our coping skills are and not only that but like illness will change how we cope so yes. maybe we've coped before by being busy mm-hmm. and now all of a sudden we're at a standstill yep. you know so how do we deal with this yeah so yeah so initially it was just you know myself and Edel and obviously supported by you know our managers and our yeah. separate teams mm-hmm. within the matter um, and then we had our, you know, Anne, who is our consultant psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we had our social worker, Sinead. And, and it's growing now again. We've just got another um, psychologist, Susan. Um, and we have another psychiatrist, Lola. And we're going to get another medical social worker as well. So Brilliant. you can see, yeah, it's really growing. But myself and Edel recently were just like, oh, two years. Jeepers, does it feel longer? Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I suppose starting that resource, it was back in March 2020, just as the mm-hmm. COVID-19 pandemic was hitting as well so you kind of had a double whammy at the same time yes and I had had a baby um, my daughter in in COVID and I remember uh, she was born in June 2020 and in the March everyone said to me oh you'll be grand by June it'll be over yes Um, famous last word yeah yeah so I'd sort of been on a maternity leave whereas Mm. I guess for Adele she had been working in Galway so for me it was a real launch into oh my god the world is still running Mm -hmm. um, and what's it like being in a hospital Mm -hmm. and what's it like being out in the open you know Mm -hmm. Um, but we did see the impact of COVID um on people with cancer because they couldn't bring you know yes. partners friends into the day wards they couldn't yeah. you know maybe go into i mean naturally 
try to accommodate them as much as possible in terms of getting results. You know, it's really exactly. a lonely place to be getting yeah. results. So you'd need family or, or mm. friend with you. But yeah, you could really see the difference maybe in the day ward where mm -hmm. um, I think even speaking to the nurses who had been there, you know, long before COVID, where they said there was the changes. And so that meant that a service like psycho-oncology was really needed then because mm -hmm. there was a loneliness factor then too, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. We definitely saw that ourselves, didn't yeah, we? I suppose it was the premise for why we set up the podcast yeah, in the first place. Exactly. So yeah. we can completely, completely relate to that. And I suppose sort of touching on COVID and, and everything that happened around there, is that kind of what helped you come up with the comfort trial? So the comfort trial, like as I said, when we started, various different teams in the hospital were like, brilliant, we're delighted to have you on board, you know, can you see our patients? So not just, you know, oncology, haematology, but, you know, ear, nose and throat, gynae oncology, you know, lots of different departments where the need was there. Um, and I guess I met, you know, one of the consultants, Donald Brennan and Yvonne O'Mara is, you know, a research assistant and therapist that, that works with him very closely. Um, in gynecology and they said listen there's a grant with the Irish Cancer Society you know would you be interested in going for it we can support you um, and I suppose we we had to think about well what referrals are coming into psycho-oncology what what am I seeing I guess on a day-to-day -day as a, you know with the outpatients um, at that time Edel was primarily kind of working with inpatients and I was working a lot with outpatients so it was that sense of people who who were maybe venturing in to see me for an outpatient psychology slot and talking about not only increased anxiety because of not being able to socialize as much or increased anxiety because they were given a diagnosis of recurrence or progression or that they weren't doing too well and just not being able to share that with their normal social circles. Mm -hmm. um, and then that loneliness factor was really coming up, not just that kind of existential loneliness of, you know, and sometimes I joke with, with, with patients and with people about journey, you know, the word journey and yes. especially in cancer. So <laughs> yes, I love the way you're, about using yes. that word. Yes. <laughs> but it, it was the sense that like, it's a lonely existence yes. because only you really have the disease. So while you're sharing it, it is only how you yourself kind mm. of take it on. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's various different theories that we work with, obviously, as psychologists, and one of them is um, compassion focused theory. Mm -hmm. And in compassion focused theory, or even in emotion focused theory, you're, you're looking at that existential loneliness and how do you, um, I suppose, support someone in caring for themselves around that loneliness. And it always comes down to self compassion. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really actually through the support, then, as I said, of Donald and Yvonne sort of saying, sure, go first, see what happens. And mm -hmm. then, you know, we got the grant. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how the study how started. started. And I suppose just to, to clarify for everybody, what's the main kind of goal or the out, what you're trying to achieve yeah. with the trial? And then if somebody was interested in getting involved, how would yes. they? So sometimes I get carried away with just being like the clinician, the psychologist who runs the group and yeah. um, myself and Claude, Claude is my research assistant and we run the groups and we get really involved and we love all the people that take mm. part in the groups. And then, you know, there's, there's someone else on the team as well, Damien, who, Damien Lowry, who would have, he's a psychologist and a good kind of, you know, research background. And we have to remember that there is this research piece like mm. that. We want to show maybe at the end of this, that, you know, that if you can, provide a group. Now it is online because mm. again, there was, I suppose, those issues around not just COVID, but actually I suppose illness can prevent you from turning up face to face yes. for a group sometimes. Mm. But that at the end of this, we're showing the effectiveness. So like if people were to enroll in a six week group, mm. um, does it, you know, ease anxiety? Does it kind of promote well-being? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we're measuring, I guess, each time. Yeah. Um, and when I say I just need to be reminded of that, don't worry, there's en enough people on the team reminding me, but oh. I just kind of get carried away <laughs> with, oh, let's run another group. You know, yeah. we're halfway through, we've mm -hmm. ran three uh, groups already, and we'll probably, you know, we'll still run another three or four groups. So we're constantly recruiting in that area of patients who have attended the matter or might have a consultant in the matter who have either disease progression or, as I said, kind of recurrence, or again, maybe are on a second or third line of treatment. Anyone really who experienced that they were getting more bad news and yeah. especially during that time of COVID. Mm. So did, did it feel like it was made worse due to that loneliness or did they feel that their anxiety had increased? Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the, the, who we're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. In mm -hmm. it. In it. And if they were, if somebody was listening that was interested and they were 
I suppose in, in the manor yes. is that the main campus that you're doing yes the control? it's yeah. kind of one site and I guess yeah. at the same time though because the consultants in the matter they mm. have sometimes clinics in Navin and Cavan and so as long yeah. as it's yeah. you know a consultant within the matter within the that's matter. okay too yeah. um but yeah so Cloda is my person for uh, yeah. to to mm. contact it's cloda.finnerty mm. at ucd.ie yeah um or will I call out a number if you like don't worry we can actually share oh, okay. all of this Great. Uh, yeah we will share all of these links on our Brilliant. Instagram Twitter and, and make sure to help you get the word out there Thank definitely you. and with the six weeks is it a kind of one one session a week or how often do they attend um yeah this? so it's a it's a session a week we do it's about an hour and a half sometimes it can kind of stretch into two hours we have a short break you know the way yourself you might feel like oh does that feel long but actually you know we try to make it as practical as possible so one of the big um elements of of the group is actually breath work so i'm really passionate about breath work and breathing which sounds a bit ridiculous because we just do it automatically all the time um but in the beginning when i was trying to think of okay well what theory will we put together for this group and what would be beneficial obviously there's a lot of evidence-based and compassion focused work mm. but there's so much evidence-based and actually if we do you know deep breathing it's going mm. to help anxiety it's going to help the physiology of the body in terms of once the body's calm the mind can be calm and so I asked Gronya our physio one of the physiotherapists in the matter would she help in terms of kind of demonstrating really good breath mm. work of you know again that physiology of we take it for granted Absolutely. I mean I went yeah. on a yoga course I think in my 30s mm. and she was like yeah so you're not breathing properly <laughs> yeah. and I was like really yeah. Um, yeah and so to bring that awareness of it's mm. not just you know in and out mm. but it's you know deep and it low. can be hard to get your head around because you're going through something so complex mm -hmm. to think that something as simple as breathing properly yes. can help it just doesn't seem like they kind of coincide no. but it's so yeah. true when you actually breathe properly uh, you know and people often say like oh actually I just realized now I'm holding my breath yeah, yeah. like I didn't even realize I was holding my yeah. breath so there is so much breath work and mm. week on week we try to build on the skills yep. so you know even at the end of today we can even do like a little visualization or something but it's to try to give tangible skills to patients where they say oh actually I remember doing this and we we not only did the breathing or the visualization or the mm. meditation but we learned about how our brains are programmed to be you know looking out for danger I learned mm. that it's not my fault that I worry and I mm. learned yes. that actually there's a way I can self-soothe mm. so by the end of six weeks it's really about not only getting in touch with your own self-compassion which is so moving by 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 the sixth week I mm. like I am genuinely so grateful for the patients that share with us mm. and we get so much from it but to see someone's transformation nearly yeah, you know yeah. to go from I worried to now while this is so mm. difficult and I have to live with this diagnosis mm. it doesn't take off my whole life and mm. to get that feedback is amazing and is that how you measure you kind of do you do a baseline kind of questionnaire yeah. at the beginning yeah. is that what it is okay yeah so Clodagh does various different questionnaires okay. like one of them is the distress thermometer I know you're yeah. familiar with that but again it's just about yeah measure in the beginning yeah. measure at the end but then we also measure a good 12 weeks down the line mm. as well so mm. like have people been able to kind of take that on board yeah. and then obviously compare it to a control arm of, of mm -hmm. people who who haven't been doing it but we still mm. offer it to them actually afterwards so Excellent. we're yeah. always rolling yeah, out. Yeah. and if somebody say um completed the comfort trial mm -hmm. their six-week course would they still be um allowed to access psycho oncology services at oh absolutely yeah. yeah it's 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 separate and yeah. simultaneous nearly like yeah. sometimes we'll get you know the individual referral um you know sometimes we'll actually you know Claude or myself will get you know the consultants or the teams contacting us directly mm -hmm. you know patients contacting us directly because yep. they'll see the posters mm. um and in a way it's funny because you're kind of wondering at the end you don't want them to be you know distressed and contacting yeah, psycho-oncology separately yeah. but in a way we're also seeing that people have never had maybe a reflective space or mm. never have gained the insight around themselves mm. and now they're saying actually I'd really like to talk about yes. my diagnosis I really like to talk about meaning in my mm. life now or mm. acceptance around death mm. so while of course we in psycho-oncology need a certain sort of level of distress to access the service mm. um there's also something really interesting in some of deciding now is the time when I really want to access the service Absolutely. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. that's great. And I suppose you said there how grateful you are for everybody that goes on yeah. the course, but I've no doubt they're very grateful for yourself and all the work that you're doing on their behalf as well. It's nice for us as nurses sometimes if you see somebody in distress just to have somewhere to advise mm -hmm. them to go or to be able to email somebody like mm -hmm. Loda because as you said, we can't be everything for everyone, mm -hmm. but knowing that there's a service there, it's, it's just really it's changed so 
change. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's so beneficial. And then maybe we might just talk about what the difference is between pity and self-compassion, if that's mm. okay. So it's a it's a part of the course that I tried to actually look into, but it, it comes more from my memory of maybe sitting with the first patient I ever sat in in St. Vincent's, where I think we spoke about compassion and she just said, so you want me to pity myself? Mm. Um, and that always stuck with me. And I think I hear it a lot anyway. I do hear people sort of say, um, yeah, but does that not mean then I'm just going to kind of lay down and give up? And, and I suppose what we try to educate people in, in in the course is is the sort of traits of compassion, which would take courage, which would take responsibility. Um, there's a wisdom, um, and of course, then there's a self kindness. Mm. But I suppose if you were to just think of it on a spectrum, you know, we often think of that idea of walking in someone's shoes. Mm. Pity has a sort of a, a looking down on mm. someone. There isn't much feeling or thought. You just, you, you know, it is a looking down. And I think that's what makes us feel uncomfortable when mm. we think, oh, I don't want anyone pitying me. Mm. And we kind of get defensive around it and we kind of want to push people away. Um, and then I suppose you might have like sympathy, which is I extend it, I feel for you, and I have maybe thought about it. And empathy again is that one step further of like maybe being and nearly being in someone's shoes or that piece that we talked about earlier where we can really understand. We'll never know someone's perspective because it will always be theirs, but mm. we can try to understand. And I, I guess compassion then is that like final step of, you know, I see, I see you, I, I hear you, I feel it myself. And now mm. I really want to try and ease your suffering. Mm. So it's that next step of, I, I want to be there for you and mm. help ease that suffering. It's not necessarily fix it because mm. we can't, but it's, it's taking it to that next level. And so when someone talks about it for themselves, you know, I'll often joke about, yeah, so sometimes it's nice to treat yourself and have, you know, the cake and uh, or buy yourself something but it's really how you think towards yourself if you mm. have a very self-critical attitude where you're just like come on get on with it you know you have to just get on with it there's no point in crying mm. about this mm. that's quite harsh it's like mm. you're kicking yourself when you're down versus the courage it takes to look at your suffering mm. um, and and I guess we don't want to see our pain, do we? Mm. We want to kind of move away from it. But when you can have the courage to mm. sit with your pain and know that you actually don't have to do anything with it, mm. you're just acknowledging it. Oh, there you are, mm. you're here. And then like, you know, it, it goes. I often say what we resist persists. So just touching off what you're saying there about self-compassion. So um, like, it sounds like, and I know from my own personal experience, it's really difficult to be able to give yourself some self-compassion so would you say like it's a it should be classed as like a skill that people just need to learn how to do so it's would you say it just takes practice and yes absolutely okay. practice like we talk about kind of cultivating or growing self-compassion mm -hmm. but that's that's another part of the psychoeducation that we try to give that actually for a lot of us um we not that you know due to trauma in our past or harsh upbringings but maybe we have learned a way of being and it's not about blaming anybody but it's maybe like yeah i actually had a really self-critical parent or teacher or someone who drove me with these high standards but that voice sounded a little bit more critical than one of self-kindness and it's like we put them on two ends of a spectrum and we don't think that actually self-compassion can also be motivational and a drive and it doesn't mean that you become lazy but if you think about it i suppose we try to describe the the self or the compassion theory as like you know when you're in a threat mode so if you think about you know back to our fight or flight and you're in threat mode you're you're very anxious and it can feel like a threat then to be self-compassionate to yourself yes. because it can feel like oh well if i am then my defenses will be down yeah whereas i always try to say you know look at how would you soothe a small child or a mm. baby or someone that you loved mm. it probably would be with kind words and less mm. of the like get on with it and sometimes we'll we'll joke in the group about maybe that irish narrative as well yes. of like you know yeah. get on with mm -hmm. it um but really, how can you say that in a more compassionate way? And like, think about how you're then um, building on this part of the brain mm -hmm. rather than say the anxious part of the brain. Yeah. And you know, neuro neuropsychologists or neuroscientists would be like, stop minimizing, <laughs> or, yeah. or stop you know making the brain sound so basic. But mm -hmm. actually, if you were to just work on, okay, I'm going to. Um, you know, grow that part of the brain that's more soothing. Mm. So how do you do that first? I suppose you have to take down the distress. Mm. And that's where the breathing comes in, because if you can start mm. with 
the breath work of, you know, mm. really letting the body tell the mind, okay, I'm safe right now. Mm. And just watch that monkey mind of judgment and worry, jump mm. around, try to find distractions and actually mm. just say, okay, there's the monkey mind again. You know, I'm programmed to be that way. I'll just mm. give him a distraction. The distraction is the breath, mm. come back to the breath in and out. And then once you're kind of soothed, that's when you can kind of say, okay, this is difficult right now mm. or I'm doing my best. Again, mm. it's not about trying to find the solution or find the answer. It's just acknowledging okay, these are my emotions. You know, yeah. one of the tasks that we do and people often refer back to it, but it's like, I'm just going to surf this emotion. I don't mm. have to do anything with it. And I'm surfing it by just breathing in, mm. breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. And, and all of a sudden the emotion will just sort of dissolve a little. Mm, yes. But the more we fight something, mm. the more it sticks with us. Mm, exactly. Yeah. I think that's going to be, that's the power of group work as well, mm. isn't it? Because you kind of can kind of, with support acknowledge all these things and learn a little bit about your thought processes yeah. and, and I, I i always say to people as well like that it's not say a process group of everyone sharing each week because that no. can really put people off yeah, of course. but what's really beautiful beautiful uh in session six is that we do a kind of a letter writing and people mm. can choose to share it or not and sometimes the letter can just be you know how they find the six weeks but mostly it is a like, you know, dear me, I, mm. I see what you've been through. And mm. they have been the most, you know, um, yeah, tear, tear jerkers, all right. Yeah, but they right. have been the most transformative for mm. everyone else in the group. Mm. You know, if you get a very poetic person nearly, they're mm. like, oh, you, you said the words that I was feeling and you mm. can really feel everyone kind mm. of come together. Yeah. You see yourself in somebody yeah. else, which is can take away that loneliness yes. like you were talking about. Completely. Yeah. And even though it's online, it, it you know, and, and we often say like it would be lovely if we all got together a, as a group i think it, it doesn't lose the power of that connection yeah, yeah. Mm. that's brilliant and you might share um some more of the tips with us later mm -hmm. um but speaking about mental health in general how can people differentiate between what is normal and when should they be seeking help mm. And like it is a, it's a really good question because like how do you kind of standardize normal and yes we can within you know psycho oncology have different psychometrics or different you know questionnaires but ultimately i just sort of say is a person stuck mm. you know do they feel that cancer is their every waking thought do they mm. feel like they have no other joy in their life do they feel like they never have the motivation you know and there's naturally if you're looking for any sort of you know mental health issue like depression or anxiety you might be looking for a criteria like you're staying in bed all the time or you're mm. not eating you've no appetite you're not sleeping you're not mm. socializing but sometimes and this is really important to remember in in the world of cancer is that we can't you know pathologize some of the symptoms that come with treatment mm. so someone could easily say in one week well, I haven't seen anyone this week. I haven't got out in bed. I've no appetite. I feel sick. I'm vomiting. Um, I don't really feel like socializing. I'm definitely low. Mm. But then that's where we often hear the phrase like, okay, well, my good week this week, you know, yes. you yeah. know, that yeah. phrase mm. and, and people start to learn how their chemo treatment is or the mm. side effects. So really it's more about, are you stuck? Do you find that you're so very distressed or upset that it's never leaving your mind, that the mm. worry is, is taking up everything, mm. that you feel like you're not getting that joy or that break or, or feeling like, you know, it's, it's, it's becoming so overwhelming that you're not only mm. feeling the physical symptoms of again, may maybe mm. anxiety, but rather that you just feel like you can't get past it. Mm. And that even if you were sharing it with a friend or a family member, that that's not kind of resolving it. Yeah. Mm. Because you'll often find, as you know yourself, that like if someone comes in and they have a chat on the day ward, that can be enough, yes. you know? Yeah. Everyone, yeah. no matter where we are in life, we just want to be heard. Mm. And sometimes just having that space to do that. Mm. And especially, and I don't know if this is true to say more of women but maybe you know we we think about our children or we worry about our family and so mm. we don't want to burden them now of course mm. i hear that from men as well mm. but you know how much are you holding in is there any kind of um escape for you that you can let some of that out mm. and again there's as i said like different we try to meet someone where they're at and that's what i was saying earlier about the different members of the team from psychiatry medical social work psychology mm. you know a clinical nurse specialist and so maybe it's someone meeting in the day ward and saying yeah i just got to offload mm. and it really helped and you helped me kind of reframe how I'm thinking about some of my worry mm. you know then there could be you know again maybe a more existential piece I really need to come to terms with my death and I want to 
talk about that and I need mm. to talk, you know, in psychology or, mm. and again, maybe even psychiatric, previous mental health, you know, um, mm. whether it's that there's medication or, you know, that a person feels they need, you know, medication or a psychotropic and, mm. or, or there's any sort of self-harm or any risk or anything where, you know, all hope, I, I think, is lost for that person. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there's the community support. So it isn't always just psycho-oncology within any of the given hospitals, but there's, you know, ARC or mm -hmm. like that, it might just be once off. Um, mm -hmm. But like not to underestimate anyone on the ground that's like the, the nurses in oncology and hematology, like mm -hmm. they can be, um, or even the H HSCPs. I remember recently I was... Um, you know, working with a, an inpatient, but really I felt his real therapist was was Dave. He used to bring him down for a coffee in Starbucks, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, and I was like, mm. I think I think that's your psychologist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I think it's just as long as someone doesn't okay, feel. So. Yeah. And as mm. long as someone doesn't feel so stuck, mm. you know, and that can go for anything in life, you know, mm. whether it was grief or illness or relationship mm. breakdown, like that they feel they can on days move past it. Mm. Yeah. And you touched off there, which we know a lot of loved ones um, mm. listen to, like a loved one of somebody going through a cancer diagnosis, listen to the podcast. And if there is somebody that is, uh, I suppose, trying to support somebody that mm. has, is a bit distressed or is struggling with um, their emotions or their mental yeah. health, is there any, I suppose, tips or suggestions that you would have for how they could do that mm -hmm. in that situation? Like, I think even, you know, for us, we have to remember, you know, okay, you can't pour from an empty cup. And often I think, and again, probably relating back to my own experience, we're trying to juggle so much in terms of being there for the person who has cancer, or we might be trying to juggle getting into hospital appointments while balancing a job or looking after the home or children while also trying to be there for the person who is maybe an inpatient at that time. And how how are we taking care of ourselves like so is there other support again like whether it was through arc or or again like our medical social worker when we have um you know families that really require that extra help like saying it's okay that maybe i also need to see how much i can be there for someone and i and I am a fan of journaling anyway, but maybe getting pen to paper and saying, okay, well, what are my worries or what are my fears or what is the worst of this for me? Because then maybe together with the person who has the diagnosis, they can sit and kind of say, so actually this is what I'm feeling. And maybe I'm thinking that you're feeling all these things and you're not. And it would really help for us to share this together and nearly kind of get a sheet of paper and have your list of what can be controlled and what can't be controlled. Okay, we can't control cancer, but we can control how we respond to it. So, um, you know, I can't control chemo days, but maybe I can actually control how I experience, you know, the day ward. Um, I can't control what my, cons my consultant's going to say at the next appointment, but I can control how I am between now and then. Am I going to yeah. do breathing exercises? Am I going to do self-compassion exercises? Mm, yeah. You know, are we going to get walks in? Are we going to have things to look forward to? And mm. I think sometimes at the end of the day, we are creatures who just like control. And when we yeah, have yeah, a, a diagnosis, all control feels like it's mm. lost mm -hmm. and so working together as a team and so not only acknowledging what you you were feeling but then also checking out with your your partner what is it that you're feeling so that we mm. can either be on the same page or i can know that actually these are my feelings and they're not your, yours and yeah. um that's really useful. and does it need a sec do i need a separate space to mm. to talk about those because mm. i think for me you know personally um and i suppose this is kind of sharing a bit but you know, I remember my mom saying, you know, I'm the one fighting cancer and you're all fighting each other. And I have four yes. older brothers yeah. and we were, we were like, you know, who's going in, who's doing this, who's doing mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, and I remember it just gave me so much pause. And even though I'm very much against the fighting cancer terminology, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I knew what she was saying. She wanted yeah. us all to just, you know, be there for each be other. Yeah. And, you know, I guess mm. she's the patient and she needed to mm. say that to us, yeah. you know, because mm. we were all struggling in our own stuff. So, yeah, of course, I think yeah. naturally as well, sometimes you can take it out on the people that you love and the people yes. that you know you can. And yes. I know that's not right, but it's, I think it's a default. Mm -hmm. It's something mm. sometimes mm -hmm. we're all a little bit guilty of. Yeah. And I always like, I, I don't know, I, I just like kind of 
you know, metaphors or analogies or images, mm -hmm. but you know, even a patient the other day was saying, I'm just getting so frustrated. And I'm like, you're telling me you haven't slept in, I don't know how many weeks, yeah. of course you're getting frustrated. Yeah. So it's really about validating, mm -hmm. you know, and it's about listening to the person and not trying to fix it. So not trying to get to the next thing, yeah. but really listening to what they're saying mm -hmm. and, and kind of validating, like, of course you'd feel frustrated, exactly. but also in any situation, like if you, life, if you think about a weighing scales and our stress is always when we feel that we can't cope. So if the stress outweighs our coping skills, mm -hmm. and then when we feel confident and we can cope and our coping outweighs the stress, then we don't feel mm -hmm. overwhelmed and agitated. So it's always just about trying to see what that balance is and, yes. you mm -hmm. know, yeah, just, I guess, trying to find it, which is difficult. Yeah, which yeah. Just the difficult. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Mm -hmm. And I suppose for people who are listening, is there any practical tips that people could be doing themselves at home to support their emotional and mental well-being? I know we touched a little bit on the breathing side of things. Is there other things that people might do to support themselves at home? Yeah, it's funny. I'm always just right into the breath. Take a breath. Yes. It's like, you know, um, you know, the nose is for breathing, the mouth is for eating. And it's always like Perfect, nose yeah. in low and slow. And I think, you know, maybe wrongly or rightly but i think mindfulness became a bit of a buzzword and people started to say oh god i can't stand that or mm. and it's difficult so try to strip past things like oh i need to meditate or i need to do this and get rid of the shoulds and just actually sit quiet sit with yourself sit with your breath and and see the impact of actually just inhaling in and out because that's your natural you know soothing rhythm it, <laughs> it just happens for you automatically um, and I think just, again, I said about the power of journaling, but maybe just, you know, getting pen to paper and saying, okay, what is happening for me right now? Because I think that will lead you in the direction then of saying, actually, maybe I need to talk to a professional mm -hmm. in order to be able to help myself in this situation so that I am not you know, absolutely exhausted and not there for, for the people who I want to be there for. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So again, yeah, I think, and like really take into account sleep diet mm, exercise yes. yeah. but it is it's like going back to the basics and sometimes even around self-compassion i'll say okay if you think about a small little baby and they'll cry when they're fed or when they're not fed and when they're tired and you know when they need to change and actually we need to do that for ourselves so like what's my sleep hygiene like do i set up my room in the best possible way do i mind myself do i know how to mind myself um and really get back to those basics of mm. uh, and then if not and it's like, right, I need to go straight to my GP and have a chat and, and maybe see what I need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant. That's great. Because as you said, they are the basics, but sometimes the mm -hmm. basics are the hardest thing to, to grasp do. because you yeah. know what to do, but it's it can be so difficult mm -hmm. to do it at times. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that's it's good to know that yeah. those options are there and mm -hmm. that and people do actually know what to do and they have the skills. It's just sometimes retraining yourself to yeah. do them again. Um, and then would you mind just telling us about um, compassion, the compassion focused approach that is often needed with cancer patients and maybe you might be able to do a little bit of an exercise with us like we talked yeah. about earlier on. So I suppose, you know, um, from a psychology point of view, there's you know many different theoretical orientations, whether it's CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, um, acceptance and commitment therapy, you know, these are all theories that of course you know we learn and we have to try and you know um implement and we're the ones that learn them and then we try to share them sort of therapeutically um and i suppose with compassion focused theory it is that idea of just trying to build on that self-soothing and try to reduce that distress and um, that we might be naturally prone to and then how can we change that inner critical voice that we actually all have it's not like you know we're all going around you know um so harsh to everybody else mm. as well but that we do, we can just be a little bit harder on ourselves. So how do I notice, oh yeah, there I go again saying, well, you should have done that or you shouldn't have done that. Um, and how can I change that to a more compassionate voice? Mm. Um, so yeah, we could do a, a, just a really short exercise, which is one yes. of the things that we do uh, mm -hmm. um, in the group. So I always just say, yeah, try to find a, um, a relaxing position, maybe you're two feet on the ground. Mm. Um, and again, that's just to kind of ground yourself or to signal your, your spine to your to your mind that actually I'm present and um, you know it's not about falling asleep and having a lovely nap as mm -hmm. I think people often perceive it to be and if you want to close your eyes it just kind of helps you to to have a focus and then all we want to do is focus on our breath so again it's such a simple activity it happens naturally 
but our minds are programmed to be busy and to be always looking for distractions, whether it's in sounds or sensations, or sometimes our mind will be taken to worries. So when we say just to bring that focus to the breath, we're just concentrating as if you were almost responsible for breathing in and out. It happens unconsciously, but if you had to consciously be aware of breathing in and breathing out. And again, whatever is natural for you, but if you can breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth, or even better in through the nose and out through the nose. But again, it's more about just finding a natural rhythm for you. So breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. In and out. And perhaps noticing if you can get that breath, not in such a big breath that you're going to take a gaspy inhale, but rather you're getting it low, as in low down into the diaphragm. So you're almost feeling your tummy just under your rib cage lift. And if it helps, you can maybe rest, rest your hand on that tummy or just under the rib cage to notice on your next inhale, is there a rise and on the exhale, a fall. So breathing in and breathing out. So deepening that breath just with the length that you inhale and with the length of your exhale out. So again, breathing in, feeling the rise, and then on your exhale out, feeling the fall. So if you were to do that even for a minute a day, that would be a mindful exercise, or it would be just a present moment exercise. And just even now you might notice that actually, yes, there's a calming effect and that that is your body signaling to the mind okay i can be at rest so if you want to just let your hand rest again on, on your lap and i'm going to ask you to just bring a slight smile to your face so you're not showing your teeth but you're just curving up the edges of your mouth in a slight smile And you're going to breathe in now and breathe out again, just keeping that slight smile on your mouth and maybe keeping your mouth closed or opening it, obviously, if you need to breathe out. But just breathing in again with that slight smile, breathing in, breathing out. And maybe noticing if there's a, a contentment that that smile brings. So again, we know from psychological studies that the facial muscles in a smile can signal a state of joy. But right now we're just bringing a state of contentment where we're breathing in and breathing out. And again, I suppose just for the sake of this exercise, I'm just gonna ask you to call to mind someone who you love, who you know loves you, and that almost when you think of them, that that slight smile becomes natural. And sometimes we can call to mind someone who loved us, who's this deceased or not with us anymore. And while there might be sadness in that, we don't want to get caught up in that right now. We just want to nearly bring about the felt sense of what it's like when we imagine this person who really loves us, or maybe this person that we really love. And, and again, we just want to maybe call to mind a phrase that they use for us when we're in difficulty. And it could be your pet name, it could be an abbreviation of your name or a nickname. It could be that they just say, it's okay, pet, 
don't worry, darling. Or as I said, it could be, I'm here for you, boo, or whatever your, your name is. And again, just breathing in and out, just that sense of, of that reassurance. That kind of calming phrase or that sense of someone really being there for you. And all we want to do is breathe in and out to that sense of, of someone being there for us and really letting that feeling sit with us so that we're nearly physi physio so that we're nearly feeling the sensation of of love of kindness and then when you're ready you can kind of let this the, the natural smile go from your face but i want you to keep in mind that sensation and that sentiment of i'm here for you or you're doing your best or again that nickname that might be used in times of difficulty and take that away today as maybe the internal voice that you use with yourself now instead so that instead of maybe being critical or giving out to yourself that you use that same phrase or that same nickname and that's building on being compassionate for yourself. So we'll just take in a last breath and maybe visualizing bringing in that loving sentiment and then exhaling out that loving sentiment and kindness as if to others. So breathing in and exhaling out. And again in and out. And last one, in and out. And then when you're ready, maybe just opening your eyes and giving yourself a little stretch. And even if you feel, oh, that was a bit trickier than I thought, or actually lots came up for me, or I wasn't quite sure, it's just, I suppose, the start of, okay, this is how I can start to treat myself differently. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, Nate. This has been such a privilege. Thank you so much for talking to oh, us today. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Answers for Cancers podcast. Please share this podcast with anybody who you think it might help. Also, if you can like and subscribe, it lets people know we're here. You can alternatively contact us on Instagram at the Answers for Cancers underscore podcast. And if you have any questions on anything that we discussed today, please email us at the Answers for Cancers podcast at gmail.com or you can DM us on Instagram.